I'm Bunny Pounds, and this is our book club, Jesus in Politics. I'm so excited about this time together. We're going to have an incredible time, and I'm so excited that you guys are all joining us for these five weeks as we talk about my book, Jesus in Politics. It's going to be an incredible time. Um, This book is really a miracle. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. I have wanted to have a publisher for a long time. I've wanted to have a published book. It's been on my to-do list. You know how you have those dreams and they finally happen. It was just an honor to have Charisma Media come alongside Frontline Books and publish this book and my story. But we're going to be talking about this book. And it's one thing for people to, to have a book published. It's another thing for people to buy the book. So if you've bought the book, thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough for getting out there and just making the book successful. We hit number one on two major categories on Amazon just last week as new releases. I want to thank God for the 700 Club also for helping us get over that hump. But you guys have been out there pushing this book, and we're so, so thankful for that. Um, So we're going to talk about the book, and we're going to start with chapter one and chapter two. But every week, if you've got the book, we're going to read two chapters a week. This is on Audible. I did the whole audio recording myself on Kindle and then also in paperback. And by the way, paperbacks are the most important thing for you to buy. I found this out from my publisher. Buy the paperback and share the paperback because that counts towards the bestseller list and book scan. So help me with book sales. That would be great. Um, anyway, so we're going to be talking through the book, and you're going to get to meet so many people in the book. So whether you've started the book or not, this is going to be a great opportunity for you to experience people that are in the book. And when you do get to that part of the book, you're going to be like, oh, I saw them on the Christians Engage webinar book club. That's so great. Um, I already had a couple of major testimonies. One was a pastor on the Caribbean, a Caribbean cruise somewhere finishing the book just really blessed by the whole thing and a elected official in East Texas that let me know that he had read the whole thing and was extremely ministered to. So it's just such a blessing, but I want to introduce you first of all to my awesome husband, Tim pounds, who the book is dedicated to Tim. How is it going? It's good, babe. How are you? It's so great to have you with me tonight Mm -hmm. for an hour and a half. Yeah, no, an hour. We're not going an hour and a half. Well, no, but you're you're going yes. out of town. So. Yes, I'm going out of town like I always do. Mm-hmm. So um, tell me, what do you think about this book being dedicated to you? Because it's, you're the most important person in my life. I mean, I think it's the biggest thing is it's, it's so surreal, I think, that it's actually happened and that we're even here right now. It's It's just kind of wild. It's things that... I think when we were younger, we probably never even, I never dreamed of anything like that, I think, even though you've obviously had the dream for many years, but it's just, it's very surreal and I'm very proud of you and very thankful and here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Well, tell everybody a little bit about our family, our kids and. I mean, man, that's a big, big thing. Well, we've got two boys, right? Ben and Israel. Israel's the oldest. He's 27. He has a beautiful wife from that he met at Bible school when he was in Romania. And her name is Teodora. And they have a little a little baby girl. Her name is um, Janessa Leia Pounds. She's just a little over two months old. And she's so beautiful. She's the first girl in our family. Yay! I had all brothers. And then we had boys, and then so I was wondering, will we will we ever have a girl? And my dad, my dad did have one sister, but they were all boys. Like they had three boys and one girl. So thank God we finally had a girl in the family. I was so thankful. Then we have Ben. He's twenty five, and he's married to a beautiful Brazilian girl, Julia. And then they have a little baby boy. He was our first grandchild. His name is Grayson Lee. Quick story about Lee. So my father, his name was Thomas Lee. I am Timothy Lee, then Ben is Benjamin Lee, and then they have Grayson Lee, so we have four generations, and then you have, your dad was named Jackie Lee. Yep, and you'll meet my dad in the story too. So, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of Lees in our family, it's a little side story there, it's kind of cool though. Y'all don't know this, but I'm Martin Lee. Are you really? Oh, yeah, Pastor Marty's in the studio with us, so he's Well, there we go. Wow. Lee's all around for the win. It's a small world. (laughs) 
So what has it been like as a husband of somebody been involved in politics and government for all these years? Well, we go back to being surreal. So we used to have a, a restaurant over by the SMU campus called Roly Poly Sandwiches, a small franchise. And I still remember you coming to me and telling me you wanted to go back to school. And my mouth was like, what? <laughs> I remember, too. Cause, I, mean, I was afraid to get, tell you. Well, I mean, you get so caught up in, in life, right? And the busyness, uh, kids going to school, picking them up practices, baseball, basketball, and just whatever else, church and, you know, playing drums, worship practice, all those things. You get so caught up in, in the busyness of life that sometimes you it's hard to take a step back and imagine how life could really be. You could fit something else into it or how it could be different than what it is, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I had a lot of fear at that time also, too. Plus, the restaurant was super hard work, very, very stressful, very busy, Um needed a lot of attention. And so you did a lot of the things that I didn't want to do. And I did things you didn't do. But even though you were good at a lot of the things I did, and I could do some of the things you did. We were great business we, partners. We were, we were great, great bus business partners. Great business partners. You like you did the payroll, right? Mm -hmm. You did. You would make food. You did dishes. You would do food ordering. And then I would do the schmoozing and deliveries and the catering orders and all that type of stuff. And But we worked together really well. So I think I just was like, like, uh, you're going to leave me, you know, but here we are after all these years. And I knew sometimes, you know, your feelings can lie to you, right? You mm -hmm. may feel something, but you know, deep down or, you know, by the spirit that it's, it's the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And so yeah. sometimes you just step out in faith, even though you don't understand, right? Like Peter, I'm sure when he was called to walk onto the water, he was probably like, you know, I don't know if he was really like, oh, I got this God. You know what I mean? He just obeyed. He just heard the voice of the Lord, and he just went for it. Well, that was a step of faith for our family, too, because you we were on the Dave Ramsey plan, so you are like, we're not taking out a student loan, and so we're going to pay this off class by class. And I, I literally could have finished two—I had to finish two years of college yeah. while, while the babies were young. I mean, they mm -hmm. were little— um, but I ha I had to do it over the course of three and a half years because we mm -hmm. didn't have the money to pay the Dallas Baptist University tuition the amount of money that they wanted. So um, it was like a long haul yeah. to finish college. Yeah, I don't even remember some of those details. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am seven years older than her, though, so I will. That's my yeah. That's my little disclaimer. Well, and Tim will be with us on the last week because we're going to tell our whole love story. You guys will get that in Love Does oh. Chapter Ten. Okay. Yes, okay. Chapter Ten. Let's just give them a preview for a second. Just what's we didn't discuss this, so I don't want to give away too much. So, um, what's the preview? Well, just tell them about you were laying in bed and you were, we were best friends. So, so yeah, so I, I got saved when I was twenty four years old. I'd come out of just a crazy lifestyle, uh, you know, down in Deep Ellum, you know, just crazy lifestyle. I won't even get into that right now; it's irrelevant. But <coughs> and so I got saved, and I kind of just by the spirit, just kind of cleaned up. You know, I dressed differently. I looked differently. I acted, I walked, I talked. Everything was just different about my life. And just by a miracle of, of what Jesus did for me. And, and then I, I meet Bunny and I guess I was 24. She's like 17, 18. And we met at church and she literally was like my little sister. And we literally were just a part of a group. We always went to eat. We stayed up, out, stayed out late. We went to concerts. We went to revival meetings, Bible studies. We just always hung out, drank coffee, went to IHOP, did whatever, and just hung out, played frisbee golf, all that good stuff. We just had a big group of friends. And and but I always wanted to be married. Our pastor always talked about being married and finding the the the, the God God ordained wife. I know that sounds radical. Sounds crazy. In the world that we live in today with online dating, et cetera, et cetera. But for some reason, I guess because of how I was saved, I knew that I knew that God could do it. And that was my heart. And, you know, like it says, let it be, a, let it be according to your faith, right? Amen. And so for me, that was where my heart was. And I remember I was laying in bed one night and I was just, just, and this is when God has spoken to me some of the deepest times. I was in a quiet place in the dark, just under the covers in the bed and just focused on Jesus. And I literally had my eyes closed and I was going, Jesus, I just, I love you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for bringing me out of darkness. Thank you for delivering me. 
thank you, Jesus. I love you. I literally just focused. And I was just like this really intimate moment where you just feel like the world is kind of going away and you're, you're, you're becoming tunnel visioned on him and thinking about being in his presence. And all of a sudden I felt a very warm, beautiful, strong presence of the Lord come upon me. And he said to me, he said, I heard the voice of God. And he said, Tim, what about bunny? What about bunny? That's a very, very important question. And I was obviously it was an awestruck moment. Like I'm being visited by God. Right. Yeah. And and my first response out loud was, God, what about Bunny? (laughs) And literally, and I was like, and I didn't hear nothing else. You know, it wasn't an audible voice. It was it was like spirit to spirit. And and from that point on, what about Bunny? I couldn't stop thinking about Bunny. And so we ended up getting engaged not very long after that. And here we are all these years later. And that story is in chapter 10. So you guys will read about that in Love Does. Yep. Um, but that story, um, he kind of popped the question in a very casual way at an IHOP. It wasn't a casual way, maybe in a casual place, but yeah. it wasn't in a casual way. Well, no, it wasn't in a casual way. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very important question. Yeah. Um, but IHOP is significant for us. So we were there. We had never been alone mm-hmm. before. And I'm going to transition to Congressman Jeb Henserling, who just came on, because IHOP is, plays a very important role in both of these stories. Well, we'll tell them about it. Yeah. So we had um, we we were eating pancakes and whatever. Um, I eat eggs. You eat pancakes or whatever. And drinking lots of coffee. And we realized we'd never been alone. We'd always been at Bible studies. We'd always been at church. We'd always mm-hmm. talked on the phone. We'd always been with our families. We were, you know, some we were best friends, but we'd never been alone in a place until that day. And we just talked for hours and hours and hours. And um, and then I'll let you read the rest of the story in chapter 10. You guys have to stick around for chapter 10 for the rest of the story. Paul but, Harvey. Paul Harvey. That Paul <laughs> Harvey. And you can ask uh any of us questions, Tim and I will be here for questions at the end. And Pastor Marty, you can pitch him a question, too, if you want. So write your questions down. Um, anyway, but that turns me over to I had my first interview. I was an intern for Congressman Jeb Henserling of the te- the 5th Congressional District. And um, I had an interview with Congressman Henserling at the International House of Pancakes. Now, I walked in and I'll never forget this. And I said, this is just who I am. I just said, you know what? IHOP is really good for me. I think this is going to go well. (laughs) (laughs) And he probably looked at me like, what is this girl about? So I want to introduce you guys to uh, my former boss of over 10 years. Uh, the, The man who has taught me everything I know about politics has been my political mentor on issues, on how to talk to the press. I mean, he's still got it. Um, The former chairman of financial services and conference chair of the House uh, served in Congress for 16 years. We love you. I'm a strong man of God, Congressman Jeb Henserling. How are you, sir? Bunny, I'm doing fantastic. And I'm just curious, do you own stock in IHOP? Because apparently a lot of your life is unveiled at IHOP. (laughs) I told you it was good for me. And I knew like, I'm going to get this job. And I really didn't even know what I was interviewing for at the time. It was like, what am I interviewing for? And finally, D said, oh, you're interviewing to be the congressman's campaign manager. And I was like, really? From intern to campaign manager? Okay, let's do that. So I want to hear from you. Why in the world did you even hire me in the first place? That was an absolute miracle. I was a mom and I'm going back to school and I become an intern at your office only to graduate, by the way. I didn't have any other choice but to become an intern. They couldn't find enough credits for me to graduate. And then all of a sudden, uh, you hire me. Why did you take a risk for on me? <laughs> well, it's the first time I've ever heard that you didn't know what you were interviewing for. <laughs> I've never heard that before, Bunny. Well, you learned huh. something now. I think it was a mystery. Yeah, I, I, I learn something new every day. Uh, why did I hire you? I don't know. Maybe they slipped something into the gingerbread pancakes. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, Bunny, we didn't know each other, but we knew 
we had mutual acquaintances. And uh, I know it's cliche to say that your reputation precedes you, but your reputation preceded you. And um, I don't know. Hopefully, I'm a good judge of character. <laughs> and um, I think I knew what we needed. And I quickly found that you were a, um, that we were committed to a like cause. And so you knew that I was running on a platform that I thought the genius of America rest on the foundation of faith, family, free enterprise, and freedom. And, I, you know, I knew in my heart and soul that you were committed to, to this as well. And, um, you know, we've joked about this before, but you told me that you were selling bug exterminations over the telephone. And apparently doing it rather successfully. And I thought to myself, as there's a smile on my face now, I thought, wow, if this young lady can sell bug exterminations over the telephone, she can certainly sell a platform of faith and family and free enterprise and freedom to the good people of the 5th Congressional District of Texas. Uh, and indeed you did, and you changed my life, and you've been a blessing, a real blessing in my life. Well, thank you, sir, for taking uh, the risk with me. And I remember interviewing you as well, like, I want to make sure you were completely pro-life and completely pro-Israel. That was really important <laughs> to me. Um, and you you passed all the passed all the um, tests. So I'm glad we could pass each other's test. I might add this too. I'm pretty sure I said this. I think I also told you a wise man shared with me once that experience as an asset is vastly overrated. Give me somebody who has virtue, integrity, commitment, and a work ethic any day of the week. And that was you. That's good. Um, I love that. Thank you so much, sir. I'm honored. Well, I want you to share with people because we share in the book a lot about Christian men and women serving in Washington. And, you know, we hear all the stories and we hear all the stories of corruption. And, you know, uh, I can, you know, I don't even have to go down that path. But I want to paint the picture, picture for people out there in the country that there are strong men and women like you that honor your family, that take care of the country and that serve with integrity. But I want you to kind of give them a picture of what that looks like. How hard is that? <laughs> um, do those people exist? Tell us a little bit about well, the that most world. important thing is, Bunny, people need to know they do exist. And I know that it is popular to um, to hold Congress in low esteem. I was there, and I tend to hold Congress in low esteem. <laughs> but that's the body. It's not the individuals. Just like the church is an imperfect vessel for the body of Christ, Congress is an imperfect vessel for many members of Congress who, who went there because they felt called. Uh, as you know, I prayed over this for a long time. I was, I was trying to take inventory of my spiritual gifts. I prayed about this for years, and I'm not the only one who felt called to serve God's people in this way, because public policy can make a big difference in people's lives. And so, number one, you need to know such people exist. And that doesn't know party lines. Um, I, I left Congress. Two of my closest friends were on the other side of the aisle. Um, one in particular was actually a minister of the gospel. And I, I love this guy, but he was so right in his heart and so wrong in his head. So we were on completely different sides of what we thought public policy was. But from our hearts and our soul, as we prayed, we knew what we were trying to achieve, but we had different ways in public policy to reach that. So number one, whether they're Republicans, whether they're Democrats, there's a lot of godly men and women who serve in Congress, and perfect as they are, trying to do the right thing by their God, by their country. So you need to know that they do exist. I, I will say that um, perhaps humility may be a little bit in short supply in 
the United States Congress, but there are plenty of servant leaders. Uh, I would also say about godly men and women, you know, I, it was uh, flattering when people would come up to me, Bunny, and say, oh, thank you for your sacrifice. And I would tell them, I didn't sacrifice a thing. Men and women in uniform, they sacrifice. But when it comes to Congress, I didn't sacrifice, but my family sacrificed. But, you know, your family feels that calling, too, and, and they want to support you. And so people also need to know that although members of Congress feel committed to what they are doing, hopefully most feel called by Christ to do this. Uh, but the families, the families pay it pay a price. I mean, I, I, you've heard me say it a hundred times before, but serving in Congress, it was the hardest job I had wherever wore a tie. Shoveling chicken manure, a little harder job earlier in life, didn't have to wear a tie, but when it comes to jobs where I had to wear a tie, Congress was the hardest one. Um, but I would say what's challenging is you have to remain grounded. You have to remain grounded in your faith, um, this is part of your walk in faith. You have to remain grounded in your principles, remain grounded in your family, because you want to talk about a city of temptations. Washington, D.C. is a city of temptations. And I'll just leave on this one note. When I left Congress, um, the Dallas Morning News wanted to interview me. And I remember the reporter asked me a question, well, what do you consider to be amongst your greatest accomplishments? And I said, well, I don't know if I changed Washington, but at least I know Washington didn't change me. Mm. Um, and I think men and women who are called um, to serve uh, Christ and to serve their fellow men through leadership, um, I think hopefully they feel the same way. Well, and that's the greatest testimony you can have, sir. Washington didn't change you. And I walked with you for over 10 years of that 16 years. So I know it uh, and know it well. So I'm just honored um, that you served. Um, I, I tell the story privately. I didn't share it in the book. But to make the point that people, individual people in your life made a difference along the way. You had me create a call list of about 100 people when you left office and half that list were people that gave you $25 a year at that, you know, annual fundraiser or came out and walked in the parades with us. How can an individual person or individual Christian start walking and getting to know an elected official really make a difference? I know there were so many that made a difference in your life. Well, yeah, a lot of people made a difference in my life. And I can tell you there's nothing more powerful than having complete strangers come up to you at a hamburger place at the airport and say, I prayed for you. I mean, people I didn't even know would, would help lift me up. So, number one, it's it's probably obvious to your audience, but lifting up members of Congress in prayer, we need that help. You know, and people need positive affirmation. Um, even if you don't agree with their policies, to to hold them up uh, is still important. You can make a difference that way. I'd also say, Bunny, you and I both know this. Politics is not driven by majorities. I want people to hear that carefully. Politics isn't driven by majorities. It's driven by very active, vocal, intense minorities, which speaks to your point about one person can make a difference. Um, when I was in high school, even before I could vote, I was working in campaigns uh, for the local Republican Party. And I remember thinking that even though I could not vote myself, that between the door knocking and the phone banking and the literature drops, I knew, I knew I had brought at least 75 voters uh, to the polls to vote for a cause I believed in at age 16. So even at that early age, I convinced myself that one person uh, can make a difference. And again, as I said earlier, public policy has so much to do with with uh, 
you know, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, it makes a difference. And so one, somebody can learn about, number one, what are the issues that matter in the lives of God's children? And can I have an opinion about that? And I think it's important to note, you know, if you look at Scripture, there really wasn't an experience with democracy. I, I, I can assure you the people of Galilee didn't, didn't get to, you know, um, participate in a democratic system. It, it kind of died out with the ancient Greeks. The Romans had, a, had they went from being a republic to being an empire. So there wasn't that opportunity. But now there's an opportunity f- for people to get involved, for Christians to get involved and impact this public policy and to learn about the issues and to learn really who are men and women of faith who live out their faith in public office, who feel called to leadership, and then what is it you can do to hold them up and support uh, their campaigns, because again, a handful of people can make a big difference in the political process. So to get educated, to get committed, to support, to uphold, that's what people can do who are listening to your podcast right now. And, um, you know, Bunny, I just am so grateful. And, um, you know, when you leave public office, um yeah, as you well know, I've you've heard me say it before. There's nothing more irrelevant in politics than a former member of Congress. But I think, and I, I don't say this with pride. I guess I say it with satisfaction. I think in terms of being a rock that gets, you know, thrown into the pond, and you're wondering, will you have ripples that ever reach the shore? Um, Bunny, the fact that you are doing so much, uh, answering your spiritual call, taking inventory of your spiritual talents, and that you are the quintessential servant leader. And to think that I played a small role in what you are achieving now, I just can't tell you how much satisfaction I have. And again, what a blessing you are to me. Uh, Thank you, sir. That gave me, (laughs) you know, the typical crying happens. So Thank you so much. Um, You mean so much to me. And I'm so glad that people that are reading the book can go back and watch this and now see Congressman Jeb Henserling in person. And you're going to see him more on CNBC and other places. So check him out. And thank you so much, Chairman. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Bonnie. God bless. (laughs) So I'm going to turn my attention to Pastor Marty Reed. So just so you know, Jeb shows up all throughout the book, and uh, he starts in chapter one as the economic nerd and then ends up at his portrait um, unveiling as chairman of financial services. You're going to hear a story about us on a Southwest airline flight and so many other stories. But I wanted in chapter two to talk about campaigns because they're very, very brutal. And so Pastor Marty Reed, uh, I went into detail in chapter two about my campaign and how it even came about. How did I even run for Congress against Lance Gooden? Because we were trying to get him out of the state house. And before I say talk about chapter two, um, let me just say that Congressman Lance Gooden and I are friends now. He was the first member of Congress to sign off on this book. He signed off on everything written in this book. And I'm very, very thankful for him and his support. And uh, God's done so much in our lives uh, to reconcile us even as that. So we, even as we go back through the past, I just wanted to say that up front. But Lance was the fourth most liberal Republican in the Texas House at that point. And you and I uh, met through ministry things. And then you decided you wanted to run for state representative. First of all, tell us a little bit, Pastor Marty, about how a pastor— in Forney, Texas, starts getting politically involved and how you would even consider running for office? Well, you know, about the time I became a pastor is probably 20-something years ago, um, I heard the statistics of Christians voting, you know, and it it really was disappointing. Um, And they haven't changed much over the years, although they did get better in 2016 and 2020, and I believe there'll be a good turnout of Christians in 24 as well. But the statistics say that half of all Christians in America are not even registered to vote. 
So they have, they have absolutely no say over who who's representing them in office. And the half that are registered to vote, only half of them vote in any given election. And uh, and then the half that actually does vote, only half of them actually vote biblical values. And so I knew that had to change. And, you know, I feel like I'm just a small podunk pastor, you know, from, from East Texas. Uh, what can I do? And so the only thing I knew to do was to make sure that my church, you know, actually we talked about it, you know, we, so I do a, I do an election sermon every year in October before the November elections. I'm very active in the <clears throat> primaries because I think the primaries are the most important election, which we're in right now. If you don't get the right person in the primary, you can't get the right person in November. And so, uh, I just started encouraging, we do register drives, uh, voter registration drives at our church twice a year. And, uh, in 2016, I actually found an app from somebody that, um, and I wished I knew where it was now. I can't find it now, but, uh, it, you could put in people's names and you could tell whether or not they actually voted. And uh, <clears throat> I did a sample of my church, the, uh, all the people that come on a regular basis to our church, I put their names in. And in 2016, we had a 93.7% turnout yeah. in the election. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge step from the 12.5% that's what, is what it is nationwide. And so uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to be that, you know, we don't need that big a number. We just need to raise those numbers from 12.5% who are actually voting vi- biblical values to get it up in the upper teens, maybe 20%, and we can control every election in this country. Well, and that's why we started Christians Engaged, because right. we were like, we got to get out of get out the vote system um, for the church. And Pastor Marty was on my board for very many years. I'm very thankful for him. But to have, we had 91.7% of our Texas pledge takers voted in the midterm election. That huge. is huge, 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 right? So if you simply remind people, and that's why the role of pastors are so important. Marty, can you speak to that? The the role I know you speak all over the state um, on pastors getting involved and in, in speaking to their congregations, but as a leader, you have such a bully pulpit to speak into the lives of your congregants to shift them um, to actually participate. Well, my favorite message that I uh, right now I'm doing it for True Texas Project. I'm kind of going across the state to the different satellites and preaching on the Black Robe Regiment, which. Uh, I'm a big history buff, and I love that part of American history. Uh, the reason they're – in those days, pastors wore black robes, and they would put it on right before they went to speak, and they would take it off when they got through, and then they would go mingle with the people, kind of showing the divinity of the Word of God. And uh, when the British came over here, they knew that it was the pastors that had were, the, were really um, doing the brush fires of freedom and liberty because they're preaching the truth from the Word of God. So every time King George would do something unbiblical, they would preach about it, like – as an example, in the Declaration of Independence, there are 27 different grievances against the British, and everybody knows that, uh, but they don't know is all 27 of those were sermon titles in the previous 15 years because the preachers of that day preached on the issues of the day. So when King George did something unbiblical, they, there was a message about it. And, uh, and, and, you know, in those days, pastors were generally the most educated person in the communities. And people look to them to find out what does, you know, any issue that came up in their life, what does the Bible have to say about this? And so pastors preached on the issues of the day. So when the British come over here in 1776, the first thing they did is they went to New York. At that time, New York had 17 churches. They burned 10 of them to the ground and, and destroyed the other seven. And, uh, you know, if I got just a second, I'll tell the story about Peter and Frederick Muhlenberg. Yeah, they were brothers. Do. Yeah, and uh, Frederick Muhlenberger uh, pastored a church in New York, and Peter pastored one in Virginia. And, and Peter was already involved in politics before the Revolutionary War. We had a part to play, especially in local politics, you know. And uh, so they 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 start having this argument, and I think it's ironic because it's the same argument you hear today. Uh, Peter was saying we need to be involved in all seven mountains of the culture, right? Politics being one of those. Uh, Frederick was like, no, our job is to preach the gospel. We don't need to be involved in politics. And so all summer before 1776, they have this argument in letters. And uh, so when the British came over in 1776 and they went to New York, they burned the 10 churches down, destroyed the other seven. One of those was Frederick's church. So he gets up the next morning, goes to his church, and there's no church. And all of a sudden he has an epiphany. Hmm. Yeah. I guess we, I guess Peter's right. We do need to be involved in politics. And my concern for today is, we're still having the same argument. And I, you know, I, I've asked God, mm. it, it, church history says that something tragic has got to happen to get us activated, right? 
Uh, and I've asked God not to let that be the case. Let us choose him now while we mm. can, while we have freedom, while we have liberty. That's good. And um, so, but but human nature and, and, and history says that's not the case, that it's going to take a tragedy. When 9-11 happened, our churches filled up for about six weeks. But the problem with 9-11 was, uh, with the churches in 9-11, was we didn't have any bread. So the people come to eat, and we don't give them nothing to eat. And so in six weeks, they're like, if this is what church is, I don't need it. Uh, we need to be giving biblical answers to the issues of the day to the people that are coming to hear the Word of God. Yeah, so good. And then you decided to run for state representative, and then you, we tell in the book you later pulled out. Um, there's many reasons for that, but why, you, you've run for a couple things in the past. Why would a pastor run for office? Well, I don't really think it was a choice of my will, Uh you know, uh, we had a really good conservative candidate in our district, and he'd, he'd won one of the four races that he was in. Uh, but he he got MS, and so I had heard through the grapevine he wasn't going to be able to run again. So I began to pray for God to raise up somebody to to run against our current, who was at that time our current representative, who uh, I didn't appreciate his voting record. At yeah, time. at the time. And so um, as I prayed, all I heard was, you come against me with— uh, power and money, and I come against you in the name of the Lord my God. And so I took that as God was telling me to to run. And so I began to talk to my elders and some of the church, see if they would support me in that, and they did. And uh, and so we ran, and we were determined to, uh, you know, get that guy out of office. Um, but then <clears throat> just a few months into it, uh, the conservative candidate that I had always supported got in the race, and so I immediately called him and said, well, I'll step out. I, do, I want to support you. I didn't think he was going to be able to run again. <laughs> And he said, no, one of my consultants said it'd be a good idea if we had two conservative candidates in, you know, in hopes of keeping the incumbent at under 50% and whoever got second between us would, would win the runoff was what our plan was. So uh, that's what we did. And then right up, you know, I got in the race in June of 2017 and the signing period wasn't really till like November the 10th through December the 9th or something. And uh, well, and then, right at the end. Yeah. Go ahead. Then Jeb announces his retirement. From yeah. Congress. All at the same time. Yeah. And so I, I didn't get to tell how I met you. You know, we actually met, uh, and I don't remember what year it was, but we actually met uh, on a on a kingdom business uh, thing that somehow we got connected, and we met and had lunch somewhere, and really enjoyed that conversation. And then when I found out, I already had an interest in politics, and I found out you. We're working for Jeb. I got so excited. I like beside myself. I'm getting to talk to somebody that's in ministry and involved in the political realm, and because uh, that is kind of rare in these day in these days. And uh, one thing just led to another. You know, I mean, we we became really good friends, and we've done a lot of kingdom stuff and political stuff through the years. So when I ran, I called you, and uh, we were talking. And and at that time, you were just doing fundraising for different candidates, uh, but you agreed to. I couldn't find anybody, couldn't afford anybody to be my uh, campaign consultant. Yeah, consultant. Yeah. And so you agreed to do that. Yep. And uh, I think we ran, for the time we were in it, we ran a really good campaign. And I think we was really turning heads uh, and getting attention. I was really excited about that. And then when Jeb, when Jeb uh, resigned or we knew he was going to resign, we were both, I think, extremely disappointed. And I know there was a time there where you, you were trying to recruit people to run to recruit, for, yep. for that office. And everybody turned you down. I mean, you knew a lot of great, I mean, you know, working for Jeff for 10 years, you knew a lot of great conservative people and they all turned you down. And then I think kind of, you had to kind of the same thing. Somebody said, uh, you know, why don't you run? Well, it was, so Lance decided, we've heard in the grapevine that he was going to run for, he was going to jump from this race because Pastor Marty was putting so much, you know, and Stuart was putting so much heat on him. He jumped over in the congressional race and all of a sudden I'm like, oh no, what do we do now? So uh, it was, I wanted to share in chapter two, uh, sometimes we think campaigns are just all about who gets the most money and how many volunteers and field operation people they have. There's so many weird nuances that happens in campaigns to alliances, to um, even bringing in this, the state representative race and some of the nuances of that state rep race. And even the aftermath of that, how it affected our congressional race later on in chapter two, I hope makes sense to you guys when you read it, because all of these districts, this is why it's so important that you vote in every election and you vote all the way down the ballot, because all of these 
elected officials, all these positions affect one another, okay? And they're all connected in some level. And somehow we forget that our city council and our um, school, boards. school boards and our county commissioners are the field team for state representative and state senator and Congress. So we don't if we don't have conservative, God-loving people running from the bottom up, then we don't have great leaders to pull from for these races. So I want to emphasize that to you guys. And I hope Chapter 2 makes that case a little bit. Um, one, one of the things I'd like to say about that is the closer government is to you, the more important it is to you, right? Yeah. Uh, we we all know who's running for president, and we usually know who's running for you know Cong- um, United States senator and that kind of stuff. But you know, like prior to COVID, nobody knew who their county judge was. But yeah. after COVID hit, everybody knows who their county judge is. I mean, the closer they are to you, the more they affect your daily lives. Exactly. Well, you guys are definitely getting a lot of stuff that I wanted to write in this book and we're getting it out here now. So I've got another question for you at the end as we take questions, Pastor Marty, but um, state representative Matt Schaefer from the great city of Tyler, Texas is on with us. Smith County, um, man, a Navy man, a man who has served his community, loves Jesus, uh, served a long time, a former client of mine, and has just announced his retirement from the state house, and also an advisory board to Christians Engaged member. We love Matt. If you've seen our on ramp to civic engagement seminar that we recorded, the first version and the second version, Matt is on there. So, Matt, it's so great to have you join us tonight. Bonnie, it's really great to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Well, and I forgot your bio, so tell me exactly how many years you've served because it's been a long time, brother. How many time, How many years? I've served six terms in the Texas House, and I did 20 years in the U.S. Navy Reserves as an intelligence officer. And I am uh, happy to, happily married to my wife, Jaceland, and we have two kids, ages nine and seven. Well, and when we started Christians Engage, there was only two state representatives in Texas that I even trusted to be any part of Christians Engage, to be frank. And it was Matt <laughs> Kraus and Matt Schaefer. And uh, I trust this man with my life. I know he will never leave Jesus or leave his family. And that's saying a lot for an elected official. So, Matt, thank you for being an honorable man and, and uh, continuing to serve Jesus every day, brother, in office. Well, thank you for that. That's a high compliment. And, you know, that is the first biblical command for all rulers and all persons in authority is to worship God. It's all over the Bible. Look at the cycle of uh, Israel and and all the kings and the rulers that came along and they, they obeyed and had blessing. And then when they disobeyed, they had curses. But the overriding command to every person and every king, every state rep, every county commissioner, doesn't matter what level, that is to worship God and to love him. And if you're not doing that, then you're out of his will because all God is all government is established by God. And if you're not doing it his way, then you're in disobedience. There's just there's only two courses. There's obedience or rebellion. And those are really the only two options for any elected official. Yes. And yeah. you are awesome. Um, so I tried to recruit you for Congress, Matt. Remember you told me no. Yes. He turned you down. He turned He's one me, of the ones. You were one of the ones that turned me down. That's why you're in the book. Um, and I remember, I'll never forget your wife, uh, Jacelyn, turning to me and go, Bunny, like after an hour of trying to talk you into it. And you're like, oh, I don't know. Um First of all, I want to know why why you didn't want to go to Washington. You've had several opportunities to run, and I, I want people to understand the dynamics of why people choose not to go sometimes for higher office. But she turned to me and said, Bunny, you have the passion for this district. You know everybody. Why don't you run? And what she didn't know was she was like the third person to say that to me. Um, but I really – I think she was the first person to say it to me, Matt, that I actually – took it in because I I knew what a godly woman she was. And, you know, she's been around you in politics for so long. That was a huge thing for her to say. Um, But why couldn't I recruit you to go to Washington, D.C., Matt? Why? 
The simple truth is that if you are engaged in an elected office the way you should be, it is a tremendous sacrifice, is a tremendous strain on your family. Uh, and with respect to going to Congress, yes, I've had a couple of opportunities, uh, I think, to run and, and probably would have won at least the one that was here uh, out of Smith County, uh, former Congressman Gilmert's position. But ultimately, you have to decide what's right for your family. And if you're not willing to move your family to Washington, then you're going to be away from your family about half the year. And if you have small children, that's going to be very, very difficult. And so there is a reason why many men and women choose not to run for office who are otherwise qualified, otherwise motivated, otherwise a person who would do a great job, I think, in Washington. But if you look at where I was in my life, uh, you know, my first priority is my family. And I, I, I don't believe that God would call me to a position that would require me to neglect my family. Now, there are periods in military service and even in, in serving in Austin where a person has to, you know, be gone for a period of time. But to try to maintain two households uh, and live in Washington and, and back in Texas and split time between the two just, just wasn't going to happen. And so I was very thankful that you stepped up to run. And the simple truth is there are not many people who are willing to do that. It's really hard uh, life for people. And so you need to know when people are choosing that they are, you know, Jeb was gracious. He said he didn't sacrifice anything. I tend to disagree. He sacrificed a lot on his health, um, you know, flying back and forth every week. That puts a toil on your body, um, your your time constraints, your relationships. You have, you know, it's so much you're giving up when you decide to run for public office and running the campaign is just the beginning. It's <laughs> once you're elected is the hard, the hard thing. Um, Matt, tell us a little bit about your passion to see Christians start praying, voting and engaging. Um, number one, we hit it off right off the bat, you know, years ago in politics. And then you hired me as a consultant for a while. And then when I brought you this crazy idea about Christians engage, you were like, let's do it. Um, and you've been on our advisory board since the beginning. Um, why? There is a biblical mandate for Christians to be stewards of the government. When Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's, in our system, uh, we the people are Caesar. Okay, we don't have a dictator. We the people form the uh, authority for government in the United States, which means we have to be stewards of that. You know, the Great Commission, go in, into all the nations, uh, you know, it, it doesn't stop at the Capitol steps. It doesn't stop at the courthouse. You got to go inside the courthouse. You got to go inside the Capitol. And so a Christian has to be a steward of civil government if you live in the United States. Because you have a vote. Every time you go cast a vote, you are, that's an act of stewardship or neglect uh, every time uh, an election comes around. So Christian must think uh, thoughtfully about that. I think there are very practical issues like the issue uh, of, of, of abortion. You know, in the book of James, it talks about pure religion. And that's, you know, taking care, seek, you know, going to the widow and the orphan in their distress, that that is pure religion. And if you look at that word orphan, when a woman has gone into a Planned Parenthood clinic and she's sitting in the waiting room and she's filling out the paperwork and she signs that bottom line, that consent for that doctor to kill her child and puts the pen down on the clipboard and hands it back to the nurse. In that moment, that child has become an orphan because no earthly mother or father stands there to protect that little girl or little boy anymore. And so as Christians, we have a biblical mandate to visit the orphan in their distress. And we do that through public policy. We do that through our elected representatives. 
How can you neglect that? How can we neglect the orphan inside the mother's womb when we have a chance to vote on people who will decide whether that is legal or not? It's just basic. And so, yes, Christians must pray, they must vote, and they must engage. That was beautifully said, Matt. Thank you so much. And this is a man that is an absolute hero in the Texas legislature, and he has served God and his family and his state very honorably. And we have so many incredible bills of conservative values that have been passed because of Matt Schaefer. And Matt, I want to say publicly, thank you so much for your service. Thank you for all the sacrifice that you and your family have given And we just love you so much. And we're so happy to have you a part of Christians Engaged. And you know what's going to happen when you officially retire and you're out of office. Bunny's (laughs) going to be calling more with requests. (laughs) Let's do some speaking around the state or around the nation, Matt. Come on. Well, Bunny, I I hope that your book uh, gets into the hands of so many people. I'm glad you wrote it. uh, And I'm glad you're leading uh, this organization uh, it truly has uh, the potential to reach so many people and make a real difference uh, for our country uh, and for the right reasons and in a way that honors God. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Well, God is moving and we're going to reach a million Christians this year, Amen. guys, Amen. by Amen. the grace of God. <laughs> Come on. Uh, to, as a testimony, I won't say the number, but we got the largest contribution we've ever gotten for Christians Engaged today. That's how God works. Wow. So um, we're, we're believing for great things. This is our year, 2024. And Matt, thank you so much for being a part of this ministry. Um, we, we really, really appreciate you. Thank you, buddy. Godspeed. Thank you, Matt. Awesome. Well, we're going to close out. We got a couple of questions. So, um, you know, any hard questions, give it to, to Tim. Right, Tim? <laughs> Don't you want the hard questions? I love hard questions. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for God. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for God. But we got one for kind of Pastor Marty or me. But here's the question. If your church won't talk about politics and there are, isn't one who will in your area, unless I drive 40 minutes, what should they do? Drive 40 minutes. I agree. You know, we people don't think anything about driving 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half to go to work. Uh, if you're going to church on Sunday morning, 45 minutes is nothing. Prayer time. It's one. Yeah, it's one. It, you can worship. Listen to you the can word. Pray. Uh, and all, it, it, all the above. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time, you know, you, you need to try to work with what you got. You know, you need to talk to your pastor about the way you see, uh, you know, those situations that you, you want your pastor to talk about the issues of the day from a biblical perspective. If they absolutely refuse, then I think it is time to, to find another church. Yeah. And I talked about this in length uh, with Lucas Miles on our podcast uh, recently on woke his book, Woke Jesus. You have to make the choices with your money on where you're tithing to, <laughs> you know, where are your, where's your support going? So we want to love our pastors. We want to encourage them to do whatever. But if they can't, every church in America can talk about pray, vote and engage. That's right. If they simply won't do that, then you've got a problem. You've got a problem. Okay, I got a question. I'm going to turn to Tim. Bunny, will you consider running again? What do you, how would you answer that, Tim? Tim said no. No, I I say no. (laughs) I mean, if I just had to make a split second decision, my heart would say no. I'm really glad that you lost your race. (laughs) I'm glad now. (laughs) I'm so glad now. Looking back, I think, I mean, our life has taken so many twists and turns since that, you know, 2017, 18, with getting out of the the restaurant business, moving twice now, you running, then you starting Christians Engaged. I mean, it's just, it's been a whirlwind. It has been a whirlwind. It really has been a whirlwind. So as of right now, I would say no, but you never know. I think the real answer to that question for both of y'all lies in... Is God calling me is, to do that? Right? God, if God called yeah. you to do it, I think you would have to say yes, and I think he would have to say yes. I think If it's I just think, a decision of your yeah. will, then it's easy to say no. I think I would definitely have to really hear from God. know that I know, okay, Father, we can do this then. If, if, yeah. if you're wanting us to do it, we'll do it, right? Well, that's I'll, really the truth for all things in our lives, really, that's right? That's right. Well, I'll tell, I tell this story in Chapter 2 about Vice President Mike Pence telling me, Karen and I are praying for you every day. We need your light in D.C. 
And it hit me when we were on our DC trip last summer, which by the way, we're going again, July 27 through 31. You should sign up, go to our events page right now. Um, But we were on our DC trip and we're waiting for a senator to come um, talk to us. And I was sharing that story. And it was after we had spoken to 10 members of Congress, heard their faith stories, prayed over them. I was getting to meet with my former opponent, Congressman Lance Gooden. It was such a great uh, meeting there in D.C. And then we had two senators that we also met with and prayed over. And it turned into a mission trip to elected officials. And as I was sharing that story of Vice President Mike Pence saying, Karen and I are praying for you every day. We need your light in D.C. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. Wow, here we are, 55 people in Washington, D.C. right now, being light to the members of Congress that I wanted to serve with as colleagues. This is a huge thing. And how much more impact can I have five more years later when millions of Christians are being mobilized to pray, vote, and engage regularly and change their community? So if I had to answer that question right now, I'd say absolutely not, because ultimately I'm going to have more Blessings. You may be more effective in the position you're in now than you ever could have been in Washington. Who knows? Yes. Yeah. Amen. That's Amen. Uh, question. Can you buy the book in discounts and drop them off to pastors in your area? Yes. Email Shelly at ChristiansEngage.com and she will make... Dot org or I'm dot sorry, com. dot org. Yeah. Why did I say that? I, I had the flu, guys, for two days. I have flu head. Um, christiansengage.org. So Shelly, S-H-E-L-L-Y, I'll put it in the chat, at christiansengage.org, and she will get you a price, a uh, bulk price, but they would be $15 per person, um, and she can get you the books or have them shipped. You can come pick them up. Um, but yes, we'd love for you to pass out books. So great. And I wish every pastor in America had that book. Amen, amen. And if you... But how you could really help us, too, is if you want to order books and help us again, the more books we get sold on Amazon also helps us. So if you would order 10 or 20 books off Amazon and give them away to your friends, that would be incredible. And uh, we would just be so blessed. And I want to again thank Charisma and everybody for believing in me as a first time author for this book. Um, You can check my Bible studies out on Amazon, too. Um, Those are now People are actually buying my Kingdom Life Discipleship Bible Studies now that this book is kind of trending. So check those out as well. Um, I want to thank you guys all so much for joining us. So many people on the Zoom webinar tonight, and I know people are watching the stream as well. Thank you, Pastor Marty, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tim, I love you. I love you. I love you. Um, Final question that I forgot that I wanted to ask you was you counseled me for a lot as I overcame the failure of running for Congress and overcoming that, what would you say to people that have suffered loss in politics or are going to suffer loss in politics of how to watch their heart and overcome and get to the other side of that as we close? I think that's the best part of your story through this whole process. Uh, You know, nobody really understands what it's like to run for office and have somebody spend a million dollars in negative ads against you, you know, and, talk bad about you and make up stuff. That's the most disgusting thing about the political process. Like even right now in this election, once early voting started, you started having all these horrible stories. They're just ball faced lies come out, you know, and there's not enough time for the other guy to, to counter it. And politics is the only place where you can legally get away with lying, uh, especially in campaigning. And so, you know, when your campaign was over, uh, you were extremely, as anybody would be, you know, you were extremely hurt and wounded and things had been said and done to you. And uh, you went on like a six-week mission trip to Romania, wasn't it? And uh, and you were able to teach. You were able to do some training. But the, I think the biggest thing that happened on that trip was what God did in your heart through those six weeks. Of course, you giving out was huge, right? That's, that's what a lot of people mess up. They don't give out. They Once they get hurt and wounded, they start internalizing everything, and it just gets worse. But you actually went and gave out for six weeks. Uh, you spent a lot of time alone with the Lord. and And I really think the majority of your healing took place in that six weeks period of time where you're in Romania. I think it was only three weeks, but my husband would probably think it was six weeks. It probably seemed like six months to him, (laughs) but you know, God did some incredible things in your heart during that time. And, and your, your loss, that was the most, 
I really admired you because that was the most gracious loss I had ever seen. You know, after you came back from that trip and you did the healing, so many very biblical things happened in your life after that. You know, you 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 made amends with with Lance, and um, you even did a fundraiser for him, which a lot of people didn't appreciate. You know, at the time, but I thought it was a very biblical thing to do. Right? You're you're you know, Jesus said, you know, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, and you actually lived that out in a high profile kind of way. And and God really ministered to you and through you during that time. I mean, you and Lance are friends now and get along, and I think that's awesome. And I think that's incredible. We're not gonna we're not gonna win people to Jesus by cursing them. You win people to Jesus by loving them, and you really displayed that uh, after your campaign, throughout your campaign, and after the campaign was over in a in a very biblical way, very godly way. I was extremely proud of you. Well, you guys will read that in a future chapter. Many chapters from now. I can't remember which chapter that is. But um, yeah, it was such an honor to have you in my life and you and Mila during that time. And I'm just so thankful for pastors that understand the call of God in your life. Let me just say, those of you who are candidates or elected officials or activists, get a pastor or a couple pastors in your life that get the call of God on your life and will encourage you. Um, And that might be us. It might be Christians Engaged just encouraging you to make sure that you're continuing on the path that you need to go on. So I want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. Yes, this is being recorded. Uh, we will have it on our YouTube channel. Um, and next week, we've got some great people. Kyle Lance Martin will be with us from Time to Revive. You're going to hear about Kyle all throughout the story and our relationship with our evangelism ministry. James and Kobe, uh, who I led to Jesus on, on the campaign with Congressman Michael Cloud, will be with us from Japan next week and we've got several other guests you don't want to miss next week we've got lee zeldin the next week michelle bachman so many other people the next few weeks and i hope that this just colors this book as you read it and as you share it with others there's now these other behind the scenes stories that you didn't know and oh by the way another big antidote is this week the man who funded the super PAC against me gave christians engaged a check Amen. That is another beautiful thing <coughs> about Jesus. Testimony. Testimony of God's grace. So the things that you think are horrible things um, that are hitting you, if you deal with it in your own soul and walk through by the grace of God, he can turn those horrible failures and disappointments into victories. And Amen. that's what we're seeing even now through the story of Christians Engaged. So thank you guys. We love you guys. And we will see you next week. Bye-bye.